some pretty deep stuff today, so I'll better get started. I'm going to make this uh, brief recap as brief as I possibly can. But um, First and Second Corinthians are two letters that were written to a small church in Corinth. Well, not too small, but a church in Corinth. Um, and Paul was writing them in order to get this church back on track. Uh, four or five years before he wrote these letters, he established this church or helped establish it. Uh, spent 14 to 15 months training them. Uh, he left believing that they would be able to handle it, but not so much. They made a mess of everything. They, I would go through all the things they were involved in, but we do not have the time. They were involved in everything, and they just lost their way. So he wrote these uh, letters to kind of restore their leaders and their congregation. Now, last week, uh, Paul discussed how a husband and wife should behave in public worship. Okay, now remember, what Paul taught was about both God's divine order and also how that related to their culture. Because we talked about head coverings, and that's something we just don't do anymore. Uh, But the concept's the same, it's just not with the head coverings. Um, but because, of, uh, because the core of his teaching was really more about how husbands and wives should worship in a way that honors God. Uh, God wants us to worship as a family. He always has, and, and he wants us to do it in a way that gives honor uh, to his authority and honor to his order of operations. Now, today, Paul's going to discuss how believers should act and treat one another during worship or when they're worshiping together, because the unbelieving world is watching, and they want to know that we represent Jesus. They're looking to see if we actually live what we profess, especially in worship, uh, because they may want to follow him themselves. So he's going to be talking about, today, about that today. And today Paul's going to use the observance of the Lord's Supper uh, as an illustration. So I titled today's message, Reverence, Respect, uh, and Represent, because whether in worship or in everyday life, there's three things that all of us have to do, and there are those three things. Uh, we need to reverence God uh, in all we do, We need to respect everyone, but especially our fellow believers, and then we need to represent Christ in our actions and attitudes. Okay, there's my my brief recap, as fast as I can do it. Okay, now we're going to go into 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 17. He says, but in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet in church. And to some extent, I believe it. But, of course, there must be divisions among you so that uh, you who have God's approval will be recognized. Now, I lo- one thing I love about the Apostle Paul, have you ever met those people that they want to tell you something, but they beat around the bush so long, you're like, tell me already. Anybody ever have met with those people? Are they with you? <laughs> um, because I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not even gonna, I almost busted somebody out, so I'll keep my mouth shut. But I like it when people are just direct. It does not offend me. I, you know, I don't have time for people to beat around the bush. Tell me what you're thinking. I got it. This is what the Apostle Paul is, and I, I love it. He doesn't waste much time. He kind of uh, foregoes the whole normal, political, and polite banter that you hear socially and gets right to the point. And he quickly calls out a problem that they have, and it was a serious problem. Uh, and the problem was that, that when they were gathering together, they were having divisions. They were having cliques, if you will. So when they gathered, they started developing these social factions that separated, okay? Now, the two major types of people in this church, you have to realize, there were very wealthy people in this church that had converted, and then there were also people who were slaves or former slaves. So it was a lot of the have-nots and the have-a-lots, you know what I mean? There was a lot, big difference, and so uh, they didn't blend very well when they actually should have because they had drifted so far from a good spiritual, a good healthy spiritual uh, attitude. And one thing you'll notice, I mean, in any society is the wealthy, sometimes the wealthy feel entitled. Sometimes the wealthy feels like they're better. And so sometimes they feel superior to the poor and they actually show it. So that happened here and they developed factions and they started ignoring and excluding the poor, even in church, right? Right? So Paul called them out, and he said the following. Look at this, verse 17 and 18 once again. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet in church, and to some extent, I believe it. Now imagine, how many people look forward to going to church? I do. How many people look forward to it? I just, I'm I'm excited. I love to do any kind of church I can get into. I just love it. I love hearing the instruction. I love music. But I go expecting to be uplifted, Right? Imagine going to church and leaving feeling worse than when you got there. And not because the preacher plowed too close to the corn when he was talking, you know, stepped on your toes, but because people in that church treated you terribly. 
Imagine what that would feel like. This is what was going on here. And Paul said, there are divisions among you, and that's what was happening. These divides were starting to cause issues. Now, the Greek word for divisions here is sahizma, and it means to tear or to split, to tear apart or to split. How many people have ever been a part of a church split? Anybody been a part of that? It's terrible. It's terrible. It's not the way God intended it. I mean, people who are supposed to be working side by side with you to a common good uh, start becoming opponents, and it's just not healthy, and, and I, I hate to see that happen to a church unless they're not teaching the truth, and I hope it tears to pieces. But if they're teaching the truth, I don't want them to do that. Uh, but it's just really difficult, and that's where they were headed in Corinth. And this is the polar opposite. This word that he used here that meant to rip or tear apart, the last time he used it was in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Listen to this. He used it a totally different way. He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of what? One mind, united in thought and purpose, right? So he actually said, when he first addressed them in the letter, make sure there are no divisions. Now, he knew there were. I think he was just setting them up for the big bomb later coming in chapter 11. He knew there were, but the last time he used that Greek word was when he said, don't let this happen, but it did. So Paul made sure they knew that, that he believed the rumors, okay, that they weren't going to talk him out of it. He believed the rumors because it wouldn't be that hard to believe the Corinthians were doing anything wrong. I mean, you know some of the weird stuff they were doing, right? So he's saying, you know, and I do believe them. But in verse 19, he said something, and it sounds a little strange, but he's actually encouraging those who are being mistreated or looked down on. Let's look at it again. It says, but of course, there must be divisions among you. Now, in chapter 1, he said, don't have divisions, right? And then now in chapter 11, he's saying, but of course, there, are, there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. So he was saying that those divisions that they were having in the church revealed something about both sides, about the people who were looking down and condescending the poor. It revealed that their faith was not in the right spot. It revealed that they were thinking more of themselves than of Christ and the mission they had at hand. It revealed that about them. But to the ones that were being looked down on, they kept returning. They were being treated terribly, but they were so sold out to the mission of sharing the gospel that they're like, listen, even if I have to be treated like trash at church, we have got to get the gospel out to this known world. So I'm going to continue to go. I'll let them talk down to me. It's not about them because we have got to come together and reach people for Jesus. So what he was saying is there has to be some factions, meaning there has to be the ones who are serious and not so that the ones who are serious, people can witness how God blesses them. That's what he was talking about there. There is a blessing in dealing with persecution because listen, to succeed spiritually, trust me, you are going to have to be able to handle persecution. If you're a big baby that's always whining and needing your diaper changed every time somebody hurts your feelings, you're going to struggle. Because listen, I'm telling you, if you have not been persecuted for your faith, you must have been saved for three days. Because it's coming, right? And you have to have a, a thick skin. You have to be able to take that, right? And so he was saying, I want you to know that God recognizes you're committed despite that, and he will reward it. So that was the divisions he was talking about there, how that division could work out for a blessing. And he's going to go more in depth about that as we move into the next few verses. But Paul was just disgusted that they even used the Lord's Supper to be divisive. That was going on. They were using the Lord's Supper. Now, I want to throw this in so that people don't get confused. When I say the Lord's Supper, it's what we look at as communion. The Bible never tells us how often to do communion or that we have to do communion. It just tells us that as often as we do it, we do it in remembrance of him, right? And that's how the, what the Bible teaches about it. So I just want to make sure we got that covered up. And I don't know how often they did it, uh, but they were, they were misusing it. Look at this, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty 20 and 21. He says, when you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get what? Drunk. Drunk. Now listen, I've been a bad person throughout my life, and I remember before I got saved, I'm not any good now, but before I got saved, I, I, I had a few issues with abuse, okay, a lot of issues with abuse, but I don't think I would ever get drunk in church. There's a line, you know? Can you imagine walking in church with a jug backwards, what's up, y'all? You know? So they were, they were getting hammered 
at church. Remember I told you they had fallen off the spiritual wagon a little bit here? (laughs) That would be that, okay? They've fallen off the wagon. They're getting drunk in church. Now, when they celebrated the Lord's Supper, they did it a little differently than we do. Okay, what they would do, they would have what we would call, it was called a love or an agape feast, which is just the Greek word for love, so they would call it a love feast. And sounds like the 70s. But anyway, then they would, they would meet and they would have a potluck dinner. That was what we would call it, a potluck dinner. And everybody would bring their food from home and they would share with each other. And the purpose behind that was they wanted them to have a meal together and grow closer in fellowship. And that's just what they wanted it for. But this isn't exactly what was happening, okay? Because when the feast would end, they would do the Lord's Supper. They would bring the bread, and they had real wine. They would have, they'd bring the wine out. So what was actually happening was the wealthy would come and gather together real quickly and wouldn't even wait on the poor to get there, and they would eat their food up so they wouldn't have to share it with the poor. That's what they were doing. As if that's not bad enough. They didn't want to share their caviar or whatever, right? If that's not bad enough, then when they would go to communion, they would literally drink all the wine and the bread like it was still, like they're having beer and wings, you know, watching the game. You know, they were using that as some social event to separate themselves from the ones they, they you know, considered beneath them. And so they were getting hammered and the other people that were coming actually wanting to take the communion in order to remember God... There's nothing left for them. They would leave hungry because they would have consumed everything. And evidently, the pastors there were letting it happen. So the corruption went pretty, pretty deep. So this alarmed Paul so much that he couldn't... I mean, you can see it in his writing. He can't believe that they're doing this. You're not sharing your food. You're getting drunk. It's the rich hanging with the rich and the poor with the poor. And he's like, this is not what we were supposed to be doing. The Lord's Supper is not supposed to be about seeing how much you can eat, you know? It's not supposed to be about how much you can drink. You're not supposed to be playing quarters in the Lord's Supper, you know? It's just unreal that they had gotten to this point. Well, I love how Paul directly and unapologetically goes at him. I mean, he responded to this disgraceful behavior, and he doesn't pull any punches. I love this. Verse 22, 1 Corinthians 11. <laughs> he says, what? Do you not have your own homes for eating and drinking? I love that. He's going, seriously? Is there anything in the fridge at the house that you have to come here and do that? Right? He says, or do you really want to what? Disgrace Disgrace God's church and shame the poor. So in the middle of saying, you don't have a place to do that? Instead, you want to come to church, and he wants them to know exactly what they're doing. He said, instead, you want to act in a way that is shameful to God and his church and to the poor. So he's really, really calling them out here. He says, what am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. So I paraphrase this, and I wrote it in the CMV version, the Chris Mosley version. And I'm going to read to you how I would have written it. It says, can't you be irreverent, gluttonous drunks at home and spare the church the black eye and embarrassment your lack, uh, of your lack of spiritual wisdom? That's basically what he was saying. He was coming at him hard. And then I also paraphrased another part of that. It says, what do you expect me to, you expect me to pat you on the back for celebrating the Lord's Supper despite you're behaving like snobby, divisive, elitist jerks who think they're better than everyone? <laughs> Gentle as I am. Well, I won't, because you may impress each other, but your actions disgust God. CMV version, coming to shelves soon. The same. <laughs> That's what he was saying. So the behavior that Paul is talking about here is, that, is nothing more than just the result of pride and a lack of gratitude. Pride and a lack of gratitude. You see, sometimes when people have success, they forget who enables them to have that success. I had someone tell me one time, I'll never forget it, he comes up to me and he says, I don't know why you're so worried about God. God's never done nothing for me. He said, the, the stuff that I've built, the wealth that I've amassed, these houses, these boats. All, he said, you know who paid for that? I did. He said, you know who put the hard work in to start this business? It was me. He said, you know who put my kids through private schools? That was me and my business. God had no part in it. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, so who do you think gave you the breath to breathe? And wake up another day and go build your business and buy your things and put your kids through school. It was the Lord. So you have it because he allowed you to have it. And as quickly as he gave it to you, 
he can take it. He can take it away, right? So sometimes people forget. They get full of themselves. They think that the reason I'm succeeding is I'm better than someone else. And that's not the case. This is the mindset that Paul was talking about. Now, if there's one thing I think that's killing the body of Christ or churches today as a whole, the big church, believers as a whole, is what I call divisive exclusionists. Okay, divisive exclusionists. And what that is, is people who are looking for reasons to judge and exclude people more than they're looking for opportunities to unify, love, and share the gospel. That's a divisive exclusionist. And I wish I could tell you it's rare in churches. It isn't. It isn't rare in churches, unfortunately. I wish I could say that. And I hate to admit it, but when people say, I don't want anything to do with church, you hear Christians going, I don't understand. I do. I do. I understand why they feel that way. Because when I was growing up, no one really invested in me spiritually. No church really invested in me and my spiritual well-being personally. All I received was a lot of judgment, a lot of condescension, you know. I can remember going into church, and no matter what I wore, they were going to look at me like I was going to hell anyway, right? So finally, I started letting the red mullet flow, boy, <laughs> you know, wearing my Iron Maiden and ACDC shirts, you know what I'm saying, walking in with those on. And, and I'm like, if you're going to look, go ahead and check it, you know what I'm saying? Go ahead and check it back in black, what you got to say about that. Right, Because I just got so sick of those judgmental looks. I got sick of it. And so I understand, Christian people, sometimes we forget, yes, you're saved. Yes, you love Jesus. You are one of his children. You are no better than anyone else. The difference between me and the worst, I mean, unbeliever out there is the grace of God. I'm not better and left apart from the grace of God, I would split hell wide open. I'm just going to tell you that right now. If you don't think that I still have a bad sin nature, ride in a car with me. I tell you that every week. You know, my, I love how my wife deals with it. Nice pastor. I'm like, shut it. No, I'm just kidding. I don't say that. But it's just one of those things that, I mean, it, it's difficult to understand how people can forget. You're nothing. Without him, we're nothing. And Paul needed to teach them that. Now, one thing, I've, one thing I've tried to do, because I remember the things I learned as a child, and so one of the things I've tried to do with grace is I never want grace to be that. Now, listen, I'm not in the good old boys club. Most pastors don't like me, <laughs> just being honest. I mean, because this is, is about as decked out as you're going to see it. But, um, you know, I always thought I'm never, I want people to feel at home here. When you come here, I don't want you to say this is Christian church. I want you to say I'm going home to my church. I'm going home to be with my people, my family. And I'm not saying that we're going to be the perfect church. It does not exist. There is no perfect church, okay? And if you do find one, don't join it because you'll ruin it, okay? I'm just saying, there's no such thing as a perfect church. But I promise that if I'm aware of that kind of behavior, I will squash it. Because I never want people walking out of this building feeling the way I felt a lot of times when I was a child. So, I mean, we got to make sure we make a place where people want to come. So they'll want to hear about Jesus. Paul was worried they were creating a place where nobody would want to come because they were being so condescending. Now, another Corinthian behavior that I think is poisoning churches is favoritism for the wealthy. Anybody ever seen that in churches? Favoritism for the wealthy. No one's ever favored me. I wonder why. Oh, yeah. I'm poor. Anyway. So I love what James says about this. Now, what I, how many people here love the book of James? I knew you'd raise your hand. <laughs> um, but... My stepmom and I talk about it all the time. We love that. But the book of James, he talks like somebody who does not care what anybody thinks. He's going to tell you. So if you want to know and you want to know the abridged version, read James. Listen to what James says about showing favoritism. I love this. He said, My brethren, do not hold your faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes... And there, is also, uh, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. 
Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show what? Partiality. You are committing sin sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. I love that. Because someone probably said, is it really bad that I save the front seats, you know, for the rich people? And James probably goes, you know, sit down. You know, because here it comes, both barrels. You know, that I love, love, love how he's dealing with this. I was talking with a girl who was a Jew, a uh, really sweet lady. I really liked her. And I was talking to her, and she said she hadn't been to church in forever. I was trying to get her to come. I said, well, at least go to synagogue. At least go to something, right? She said, well, I can't. And I said, why? She said, well, in our synagogue, you have to pay for your seats, and they're always sold out, and the only ones that are left are the junk ones. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, how much did they get? No, I'm just kidding. I'm sitting here going... <laughs> No, I was sitting here thinking to myself, man, I mean, that's a lot of what he saw here, what he saw has happened, was happening. Now, as believers, our wealth is not measured in possession and bank accounts. <laughs> Praise God. It's not measured that way. See, our wealth as believers is measured in one possession that never fades away, and that's called eternal life. That's how our wealth is judged. And when they change the interest rate or the Fed does something, it doesn't affect my eternal life. You know, when they keep robbing Social Security, it doesn't affect my, my eternal life. They can do whatever they want to do, and there's one thing that's always going to be ready for me to pull out when I need it, and that is the fact that when I leave this world, I'm going to be in heaven. That's the measure of our wealth. That's what, makes, what sets us apart. So by showing partiality to the rich and the powerful and the, those who are uh, notable, we're acting like what they possess is better than what we possess, and it isn't. Listen, given the opportunity, believe me or not, it's up to you. If someone said, I will give you a billion dollars, but you have to give up your salvation, or I'll give you your salvation and you'll be poor as dirt the rest of your life, I'll be like, no question, give me the billion. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I would say, I, no joke, I would, I would literally say, take the money. Because you know what? What people don't realize is you can't take it with you. You know what I mean? You can't take it with you. And the world has us all thinking that as long as we have more toys, we won. We've had a great life. And here's the truth of the matter. An old Southern preacher one time said, I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. You cannot take it with you. Someone else is going to spend your money. But no one else is going to enjoy my eternal life but me. You know what I mean? And I, I just don't understand how we lose track of that. I'm going to preach on that forever if I don't move on. Okay, let me go on. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. Now, he kind of explains the significance of the Lord's Supper. He said, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself uh, on the night when he was betrayed. Uh, I'm sorry. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus uh, took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in what? Remembrance. In remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine uh, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me uh, as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So Paul wanted to remind him what that was really about. See, what it's really about is believers are honoring the fact that Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice so that we could have eternal life. That's what it's about. And when we have that now, Whenever we decide, we do it quarterly. Now, I'm not judging anybody, you know, do whatever you want to do. But sometimes I feel like if you're doing it every week, it becomes routine, and you, maybe you stop remembering what it's about, but to each his own. But the one thing I always tell people is when you celebrate that, you're not only saying, I am saved, and I know how I got this way. You're saying, I am saved, I know how my salvation was purchased, and I know that he's coming again. That's what you're supposed to be thinking of. It doesn't matter how bad my day's going. It doesn't matter, you know, if they're, the taxes are going up, the money's going down. You know, none of that matters when I stop for a second and go, yeah, but he's coming back. How many people in the last year, be honest with me, have said, I cannot wait till he gets back? Raise your hand. And I want it to be the day before my mortgage is due. <laughs> I do. Can't help it. That's the sin nature in me. But anyway, so, I mean, here's what you have to remember. It's a time for a believer to do at least two things. Well, let me tell you these two things that we should be reflecting on, two major things. 
First, the Lord's Supper is a time for reflecting on the love and grace that Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension represents. We should be thinking about that. But the other thing, and I'll, I'll expound on this a little bit later, uh, the other thing we should be focusing on is it's a time to reflect on our faith and judge uh, for ourselves whether our lives represent the gratitude and commitment to serving him and loving others. It's a time to check ourselves. That's what it's about. Now, that's why Paul said that every believer should examine themselves before taking it. Now, I'm so excited to talk about this topic here, okay? And I'm going to try not to be too long. Whoop, too late. Anyway, okay, but I'm really, I'm really stoked about talking about this. See, the Corinthians weren't observing the Lord's Supper to remember Jesus or his sacrifice. They weren't. They were using it as an excuse to get drunk, which, I mean, dang, you know? They were using it as, as an excuse to get drunk, as an excuse to overeat, and as an excuse to exclude people who they really believed were beneath them. They truly believed those people were beneath them. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to be wealthy, powerful, or successful. I would love a shot at proving that. But I'm not saying it's wrong. Uh, I've said this many times. As long as you honor God with your wealth, as long as you remember where it came from and serve God with it, it's not a problem. Abraham would have been a billionaire in our times. Job was very wealthy. Okay, there are a lot of patriarchs that were very wealthy, but they saw their wealth as a means to an end, as a means for being able to serve God better. That's what they used it for. Now, these came to my mind. I'm going to share these verses with you because I think they kind of, kind of put in context wealth and poverty and the importance of wealth. So there's a few verses. Like I said, Job was very, very, very wealthy. And when you see what all he lost, you'll understand why. But he was very, very wealthy. But I want you to hear what he said the second after he realized everything he had was gone. Everything, family, livestock, land, everything was gone. Here's what he said. Job 120, Job stood and tore his robe in grief. Now remember, when, when the Hebrews would, would grieve, they would tear their garments, sit down in ashes, and toss them on their head. A little dramatic, but that's what they did. Okay, so this is what it's talking about. It says, Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said... I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. Uh, did I read that right? He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. There we go. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. I just think that's powerful. I love that. And there's two more verses that I think are really powerful that kind of put poverty and wealth in perspective. First Samuel 2, 7 and 8. The Lord makes some people poor, and other people like, or it says, the Lord makes some poor and others rich. He brings some down and he lifts others up. He lifts up the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them among the princes, placing them in seats of honor. That's kind of a reference to the disciples. That's another sermon. Uh, For all the earth is the Lord's and he has set the world in order. I love that. Now listen to this one. We all came Uh, We all come to the end of our lives as naked and empty-handed as on the day we were born. We can't take our riches what? I love that. Isn't that awesome? I just just love that. Anyway, I just threw those in there because I like them. Anyway, so i got to move on. Now, if you look at verse 27, because after Paul revisited the purpose of the Lord's Supper, now he has to warn them about the Lord's Supper. There's more to this. 1 Corinthians 11, 27, he says, So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. So Paul wanted the Corinthians to understand this is not just a normal meal. There is a purpose to this meal. It was a celebration of remembrance and gratitude, like we said, for everybody who's trusted Christ. Again, this wasn't beer and wings, okay? This was something very, very important. And Paul felt like I, they were losing track of that. They were just looking at it. See, the wealthy at that time in the Corinthians, uh, in the Corinthian church, rather, were using that just as a social gathering, basically. You know, they didn't care. They weren't doing this for Jesus, right? And what they kept forgetting was people were watching them. Corinth was a very diverse city. 
There's a lot of pagans there. And they hear about this man named Jesus who came and died and rose again, who was all man and all God, and those who believe in him have eternal life, and he changes them. They heard about that. And so they're skeptical, so they are watching them to see if there's any change, right? And if they, if they saw this, it'd run them out. Why would they want to go to Jesus if that's what, if going to Jesus make you separate the rich and the poor and starve some while you gluttonize and get hammered? No thanks. I remember having that thought about some believers. I am just confessing everything today. But there was this lady who used to go with us on school trips. And uh, she always, you know, wore the Christian shirts and did all the Christian bumper sticker stuff. And I figured she's a Christian. And I remember one time I said a bad word that I will not share with you. And she jumps up in front of the whole bus and calls me out and tells me I'm going to hell. I was 14. You know? So I proceeded to share some more swear words with her (laughs) for about three minutes. But I thought to myself, if that's what Jesus does to people, no thanks. No thanks. I don't want that. Paul was worried that's where the Corinthians were going, and it, it looks like it was. See, the outsiders, he was worried, might associate their behavior, their attitudes, and their actions with Jesus. So when the, when the Corinthian believers showed partiality and excluded the poor or displayed no self-control by eating and getting drunk in church, they might associate that with Jesus, like Jesus is okay with that. It paints a really bad picture, right? And so he was saying, think about what you're doing here. What you're doing might keep people from Jesus because of your behavior. So Paul explained very bluntly the consequences for their behavior. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 11.30. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some of you have even died. Your Bibles might say slept. Uh, The Hebrews did not like the word death or dying, so they always said sleep, slumber, sleeping. Uh, But that's what he was saying. See, let me explain this process real quick. Once we've trusted Jesus, we have eternal life. John 5, 24, listen to this. This is Jesus. He said, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. life. Now, Jesus having such a great grasp on all languages, if it wasn't eternal, he probably wouldn't have used the word eternal. Because, see, eternal in the Greek means eternal. That's what it means, without an end, okay? It says they will never be eternal condemned for their sin, but they have already passed from death into life. I am not waiting to have eternal life. I already have it. I have it right now. And that's, that's what Jesus is saying here. So as a result of that, nothing a believer does or does not do can change the fact or the status that they have eternal life. It's a gift. It's given to you. You're going to go to heaven if you believe. Now, Here's the, the, you know, the battle cry of those who believe you can lose your salvation. See, you're teaching, you can do whatever you want. And I always tell them, go ahead. Great advice from a pastor. But I say, go ahead. See if you can get away with it, because I sure can't. I don't know about you, but when I do something wrong, my pillow is like a cinder block. Anybody else? Oh, man. Have you ever said something to somebody, and at the time you're going, yeah, take that. You're like, I told them. They're telling everybody else. You want to know what I told them? And you feel so big. And you get home and God goes, done? (laughs) Done bragging to everybody? Good luck sleeping, big mouth. (laughs) Because you're going to take your sorry butt and you're going to apologize to that person tomorrow. I'm like, no, Lord, just kill me. (laughs) You know? But I'm telling you, you cannot, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you can do whatever you want to do. Okay? It doesn't mean because we have eternal life, that we're exempt from the consequences of sin. That's not what I'm saying, right? We are not exempt. There are consequences, and God will have us suffer them. Just one of them isn't losing your salvation. Okay, i got to be careful. I'll preach on that forever, too. But here's the thing. God is going to do whatever he has to do to ensure that the gospel message is not damaged. He's going to do whatever he has to do. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. This is one of my favorite verses because I'm always being disciplined. Anyway, Hebrews 12, 4, it says, After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin, and you have forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as children, or as his children. He said, My child, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he 
those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Let me break this down a little bit. My children are my responsibility. So I disciplined my children because I wanted my children to grow up and be responsible, contributing adults. It's not my job to discipline the neighbor's kids. I may have wanted to, but it's not my job, right? So if you, God is going to discipline you if you're one of his, okay? It's that paternal uh, love he has for us. Verse 7, it says, uh, as you endure uh, this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as what? His own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by its father? <laughs> Verse 8. If God doesn't discipline you uh, as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate, illegitimate and you are not really illegitimate. his children at all. Listen, if you've been saved more than two days, you've probably already been disciplined. I'm just saying. God disciplines those he loves because he wants to make you successful in your spiritual life. And it usually works in phases, and I'll explain that. Phase one, he usually does, like, takes your assurance away from you and your prayer power. So, you know when you're mad at somebody, you said something, maybe the person I was talking about earlier, and you said something you shouldn't say, and you don't want to admit that you said something you shouldn't have said. And then when you kneel down to pray, you feel like it's just ricocheting around the room. Anybody ever had that feeling? You know what I mean? That's God saying, oh, hold on, Chris. <laughs> you have the nerve to ask me to bless you in another area when you are rejecting I, what I told you about making it right with that person? Listen, the grocery list stops. You need to make that right. And sometimes he takes that assurance where you just start having doubts. Why? Because he doesn't want you to feel good about rejecting him. Second step, he often gets our attention through sickness, injury, or some kind of loss. Charles Stanley one time, was he felt like he was supposed to take some time off. He was running like a chicken with his head cut off all the time. And he said, well, I will take a sabbatical eventually. I will take some time eventually, eventually. He got struck down sick and was bedridden for like weeks. And he said, you know, I thought to myself, I didn't listen to God. So he was going to get me that time to rest, even if it meant taking my feet out from underneath me. Listen, sometimes if you go past the prayer issue and you go past the assurance issue, you might suffer loss somewhere else or have an illness, something that will stop you long enough to where God can get your undivided attention. And if you miss those two and ignore all of his warnings, the only last phase that's left is for him to take your life. Now listen, not everyone who dies, God is taking. I don't like that. Okay, the Bible won't support that. He has the right to take a life. But listen, everybody who's born dies. He doesn't take people all the time. Sin brought death, right? So... Here's the thing, if you're being such a hindrance to people that the way your attitudes and actions portray Jesus is damaging the gospel, he has every right to take your life. You're going to heaven anyway, but he's got to stop that. And to give you an example, Moses, they needed water, and he says, Moses, go and, you know, go and speak to the rock, and it'll bring forth water. So he goes to the rock and basically says, the Lord told me to speak to the rock, he's going to provide water, boom, here came water, Right? Then they were crying about it again, and Moses got frustrated. So the second time, God says, yeah, you know, same deal. Go speak to the rock. And Moses says, do we have to continually provide for you? Notice how he changed the pronouns there, and now it's we, not him. It's we. So instead of speaking to the rock, he smacks the rock. Who do you think the rock represented? The rock that brings forth the water, that brings forth life. Who's that talking about? Jesus. He smacks it. And so God says, hold up, everybody out of the pool. Here's the deal. Now you can't see the promised land. Because now these people who are two inches from being pagans anyway, two inches from turning and running back where they were getting whipped 16 hours a day because they're faithless, now you've given them an idol God, you. Now they're going to think that you're the one that provides it. So it says that he took his life and that he hid his bones, hid his body. Why? Because God knew they would dig it up and worship it. And if you don't think people do that, get on uh, the internet and look it up. They still do that stuff, worshiping people's bones. So God has the right. Moses would have been a hindrance to millions of people that followed him. Now they would take their eyes off God and put it on him. So this is what he was talking about when he says, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you have died. Now, uh, finally, Paul said that they should examine themselves before taking the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty-two. He said, but if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet, 
when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So he wasn't saying, now here's something I wanted to talk about. People always tell me, well, the Bible says we should examine ourselves before we take communion. So I got an argument with my wife, I probably shouldn't take communion. Or, you know, I had a bad thought today. Listen, he wasn't saying that you should be sinless before you take communion, or no one would ever take it. No one. I mean, my brother Tony was sinless for eight hours, then he woke up. Nobody's sinless. The only sinless person that ever lived was, was Jesus, and they crucified him. No one's sinless. So he's not saying if there's sin in your life, don't take communion. That's not what he was trying to say. He was saying examine your motives for observing it. If you're doing it to have a social club like they were doing it for, and you knew you were going to go there and exclude people, he said it's best you don't take it. Because since you're not honoring my son, you're bringing judgment on yourself. That's what he was talking about. If you're going to church with your wife or your husband and you're thinking, I can't wait till this is over. I mean, sure, the pastor's good looking, but I wish this was over. (laughs) If that's you, you probably shouldn't take it. But as long as you want to see and remember God, you want to see the will of God done, it's okay to take it. That's not what he was talking about. He was just saying the way you're abusing it, it's best you not take it at all because you're bringing judgment in your lives. Because you're using something that's supposed to be about my son as a method of doing everything my son told you not to do to other people. You can't act nothing like my son and then honor him too. That's what he was saying there. Now remember what Paul said in verse 22. Let's look at this. He says, what, don't you have homes for eating and drinking, or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to do? Uh, Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. So Paul was basically saying, examine whether you're taking the Lord's Supper to remember and honor Jesus' sacrifice, or you're observing it as just another social event. That's basically what he was saying there. So don't skip communion because you got an argument with your wife. I mean, I never argue with my wife, but a lot of people do. All right. Now, if they were going to observe a social event, observe this as a social event, it was sin. So he's saying you're coming here, supposed to be celebrating the one that set you free from sin and sinning in the meantime. Don't do it. That's basically uh, the gist of it. But once they examined their motives, if they had pure motives, it was fine for them to do it. Now, Paul's advice about examining motives still applies, but it applies to more than just the Lord's Supper. Believers need to examine their motives for everything they do in the name of faith. Because if, some, if whatever you're doing for God, you're, you're actually doing for attention or money or power or fame or whatever, you might as well not do it. Because God's not going to bless it. You know, I've had someone come up and tell me how much they give at their church before. Listen, I don't even know what anybody gives here. I made sure of that. I can't even find out. Don't want to find out. Because I don't want anybody to question my motives. But when he was telling me how much money he gave, I wanted so bad to go, well, let me pat you on the back because that's the only reward you're going to get. God sure as heck isn't going to bless it now because you were doing it for attention. You know what I mean? God knows our true motives, and in time, he'll deal with us accordingly. Now, I'm going to try to get through this quickly, but I've, I've witnessed several instances in churches where I've just been so ashamed for the body of Christ. And one was I've seen more than once pastors put wealthy people in leadership despite the fact that they didn't have a spiritual bone in their body. But they put them in leadership because they had money, and they wanted job security and a, and a method of profit. And they get away with it for a while, and eventually it blows up in their face. I've witnessed so-called believers use their faith in church as a means for making business contacts. Someone came up to me once. I'm not joking. I said, you're a pastor? I said, yeah. He said, I need to go to church more. It is a great place to find clients. I'm like, or not, you know. So God knows your motives. That applies to more than just the Lord's Supper. Now, let's finish up here in verse 33 and 34, because he kind of does a, I think this is funny, this summary is basically Paul saying, I could spend all day on this, but you have so many screw-ups in this church, I've covered it, here's a summary, let's move on to the next thing you've totally trashed in here, okay? So, 1133 says, so my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home. (laughs) So you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'll give you instructions about the other matters after I arrive. So this is Paul saying, okay, I'm done talking about this. There's a lot more i got to talk to you about because you guys screwed everything up. That's Chris Mosley version. So with so much corruption, I can't even imagine how hard these letters were to write. But one thing I want you to take from this is that we are supposed to be a family. And everything we do is supposed to draw us closer. That's what God wants for a church. 
It's not, I hate it when people say, my faith is personal. No, it doesn't. Jesus died on a cross for it. There's nothing personal about that. You know what? You believe for your eternal life. That's personal. Sharing it is what you're supposed to do with it. And when you have a huge family, there's power in numbers. It makes it a lot easier to do what you're supposed to do. That's why he wants us to gather. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close there. I'm going to ask you, would to please bow your heads. Probably sound like an auctioneer. I had to get that done. But while every head's bowed and every eye's closed, we like to give an invitation because I just want the opportunity to pray for you. I don't chase you down. I don't ask you to come up front. I legitimately will pray for you. But if you, if you need prayer, bless those people. You can lift your hand or make eye contact with me, and I am, bless those people. I'm going to pray for you. I don't just say that to speak Christianese. I'm literally going to pray for you. Bless those people. Listen, if you're watching or listening online, God knows your heart. Bless those people. But believers, I always pray for us. And the reason is, every time I turn the TV on, I think I cannot believe Jesus hasn't come back yet. And sometimes it's easy to be a fatalist and to sit in the backyard and say, come on, Lord, I hate this. Get me out of here. But realistically, when we see everything that's going on, it should inspire us to live a better life for him so that we can draw more people to him. That's what it should inspire us to do. When things are getting bad, people need Jesus. And sometimes I think we need to pull ourselves out of it personally and just look at it like this. I have eternal life. I don't have to worry who's in the White House or who's in the UN. I have eternal life. Now I need to make sure others do too. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I thank you for your love and your mercy and especially your grace. There's nothing I have to offer. I couldn't exchange anything for it. I couldn't earn it. I couldn't be good enough because I'm continually sinful. The only way I could have eternal life is through believing in the sacrifice that your son made. And despite the person I'd become, you loved me just like I was. I didn't have to change anything because you promised you'd make the changes that needed to be made. You just accepted me with open arms. God, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, maybe they're confused by religion or whatever, just clear it from their mind and remind them that had they been the only person to die in their sin, you would have still given them the opportunity to have eternal life. All they need to do is believe that what Jesus did was enough to guarantee their eternal life. And if they do that, you promise to give it to them. It's so simple, we look right over it. So if someone makes that decision today, I just pray they contact one of us. We'd love to walk with them in their new journey. But for those of us who are believers, God, it's so easy just to sit back and sit on our couches and complain about how bad the world's getting. But sometimes that's as far as we go with it. Give us a passion and a zeal to do something about it, to live lives that display your love and compassion to other people, to share the gospel, and to be good examples. Let us live what we profess, God. And we just pray that as we leave here, you would keep us safe. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, let us come together one more time and give you all the praise, honor, and glory you're so worthy of. We ask these things in Jesus' name.